Okay, so Acts chapter 21. Have you in your life ever feel like you've been in a moment of decision or in an inflection point? Have you feel like you've ever been caught between competing pieces of advice and opinions? Maybe even uh, godly people in your life saying they're praying for you and then giving you advice. And then someone else is praying for you and they give you a different set of advice. And you're like, what do I do with that? Or better yet, have you been uh, at a point in your life when you feel like God is calling you in a certain direction or towards something specific, and then you have some lovely, friendly people in your life saying, I don't think that's wise, or I actually don't think that's what God's saying, or I actually don't think that that's going to be good for you or your family. What do you do? What do you do as you're praying and you're discerning and you're seeking wisdom from God, but you also have people in your life giving you different competing pieces of advice? How do you sort through all of that stuff? Where we are in the narrative of Acts is Paul is in just such a situation. Paul is is laser focused on where he needs to go, on what God is calling him to do, on what his assignment is. And as we've seen a little bit last week and into this week in the text, there are some warning signs starting to go up. Paul, if you go this way, this will happen from the Spirit in Acts chapter 20. And from well-meaning friends in Acts chapter 21, not only who love Paul but are praying for Paul and even prophetically praying for Paul, and yet Paul doesn't listen. What's going on with all of that? I want to unpack a little bit of that story and that journey with you. Acts chapter 21, Paul is in this kind of situation, and it's a turning point, not only in the narrative of Acts, but for Paul himself. And he eventually, at the end of our text, is arrested, and that starts his final journey towards Rome. So what we're going to do, this is a large chunk of text, and there are two stories. There are two pieces to this. We're actually going to start with the second one and see where Paul ends up and how he finds himself in this situation. Then we're going to go backwards to the first 14 verses and see the journey for how Paul got there. Okay, so we're going to start in verse 15. We're going to see kind of the final movement of Paul's life before he's arrested. And then we're going to go backwards and see how he got there. So your Bibles, Acts uh, chapter 21, verse 15. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Benassin of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to see James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. For we have four men who are under a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they've been told about you, but that you yourselves also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who believed, we've sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. What is happening here? If you read below the surface, if you even do more of a a scratch and you just start itching at this passage, you might come up with some questions. Like, what is happening with Paul? What about all this stuff he's talked about, about freedom from the law? Why are there so many Jewish Christians very zealous or concerned about the law? Why does it seem like the church leaders capitulate or bend to their zealousness? So Paul arrives in Jerusalem, presumably with some Gentile cohorts, because people think that will be a big deal in the next couple of verses. 
And Paul speaks with James and the elders, and they celebrate God's work and presumably receive that offering that Paul's been talking about for the Jerusalem church in the last few chapters. But there is immense tension happening here in the church. And you may have even picked that up on first read. In verse 20, when they glorify God for all the things that has been happening through Paul's ministry among the Gentiles, and instead of camping out there, they immediately go to, okay, look, Paul, there's a bunch of really upset Jewish Christians here because they think you're going crazy. What do we do about this? Now, this is one of those texts where the more I dug in over the last week or so, the more confused I got. Because every theologian, every commentator had a different take on what is happening here. Some different, really smart people, some think this is shrewd missional thinking on the part of Paul and the church elders. Right? Thinking there's like he's using wise tactics, kind of the, the wisest serpents sort of thing. Some think this is Paul making what amounts to an acceptable compromise for the sake of church unity. And some think Paul is straight up sinning by abandoning the gospel he's been preaching. And that what happens in the rest of the book is Acts is sort of a fallout or implication of his capitulation to those who are causing a ruckus in the church. It's quite confusing. I, I don't know how you read this when you think. You go like, oh, that's interesting. And then you maybe read it a second time. You're like, wait, it sort of feels like... The elders are, and Paul are just sort of bending to everyone's secondary critique. It's like, oh, wait, is, are they just being like really smart? Are they playing like 4D chess with the Jewish Christians here? And are just like, we make this move to prevent sort of this obstacle to the gospel. And the more you dig in, the more you're like, what is going on here? And as I was sitting with this text this week, uh, there, was, there was one author who, who basically said, whether Paul is right or wrong in this, we're, we're not to decide. We actually don't get clarity. It's not a black and white issue. What, what is happening here is Luke, as the author of Acts, is describing a very real church trying to figure out how to deal with real people through real complex gospel issues. And whether they get it right or wrong is not necessarily for us to decide or infer, but to sit in the complexity of what happens when the gospel comes to bear on a people, not in a vacuum, but in the midst of very real traditions, customs, habits, and we're asking the question, what do we do with that? We see some pros, some good things happening here with the church. We see they, seem as, they seemingly get like a warm reception, Paul and his cohorts. The leaders are rejoicing in God's work. There's maybe some sense of mission awareness or winsome tactics on the part of Paul and his friends. And in verse 25, we see the, the church maintaining doctrinal clarity, right? It's like, okay, there's some good stuff happening here. But then on the flip side of the coin, there's the potential for the lack of hospitality. Uh, multiple commentators saying this guy from Cyprus was the only one who had housed them because they were bringing Gentiles with them. There's maybe some appeasement to legalism or people more concerned with secondary or tertiary issues than the gospel advancing in the world. Maybe this, this tension between traditionalism and the mission of the church or at its worst, Church leaders politicking and virtue signaling because they don't want to upset people. What's happening here? It's a real complex church dealing with real complex issues. However you read what's going on here with the Jerusalem church, I think there's two things that, that we can know, that we can infer from what is happening here in the story. Number one is that in the tension of God's thing versus their thing, their customs, their practices, and what God is doing, Paul is passionate about unity in the church. So the Jerusalem church, concerned with maintaining unity, might be trying to appease those who are zealous for the law. And how often are we tempted to give in to our thing, to, be more, to care more about the, our preferences, our agenda, our customs, our culture, rather than the gospel's expansion. A quick little litmus test is if you hear about maybe the gospel going to a person or a group of people, and your immediate thing is like, well, they're not doing that right. Are you more concerned about your thing than you are about God's gospel going forward? But we see in this kind of messiness, Paul is really concerned about church unity. It's a huge deal to him and the other church. And so Paul is willing to give up his rights, his freedoms, his privileges in the gospel to, as he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, be all things to all people. He's willing to bend some of his own rights 
his own privileges, the freedom he has in the gospel to not create undue obstacles for somebody else trying to encounter the gospel. So that's the first thing we learn, is that Paul is really passionate about church unity, even in the messiness of this tension here. The second thing we learn is that God's plan doesn't always lead us away from hardship, but often through it. The outcome here in verses 26, as he kind of lets the temple know what's happening, immediately in verse 27, he is arrested. Verse 27, when the seven days were almost completed, the seven days of his purification stuff, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. And from that moment on, Paul was on the journey towards Rome. In the custody of the Jews, in the custody of the Romans, he was on a ship. He was making his way from town to town as he was ultimately going to the end of his life. The outcome, this outcome, Paul's arrest, was not outside God's plan. It ultimately led to his ministry from prison, which was quite fruitful. People were visiting him. He's firing off letters to the churches, and it shaped the church for centuries and centuries. Warren Worsby, a a New Testament commentator, says, whether Paul was right or wrong is not for us to say with confidence, right? Whether he was doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing and capitulating or appeasing or compromising, we don't know. This we know. God used the whole episode to put Paul in the hands of the Romans and not the Jews. For he was safer with the Romans because of his Roman citizen status. God used the Romans to protect Paul and take him to Rome where God had special work for him to do. So no matter what happened, this was always Paul's destiny. It was always God's plan. And it didn't hamper Paul's ministry, although it maybe changed it. Paul was choosing the harder path. And what we'll see in just a few moments from the first 14 verses is that there were loved ones, friends in Paul's life, who were telling him, this is the hard way forward. They said, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't keep going down this road. But Paul was convinced this was God's assignment for him. And to that end, Oswald Chambers, famous writer, says to choose to suffer means that there's something wrong, and I'll put in brackets, with you. There's something wrong. But to choose God's will, even if it means suffering, is a very different thing. No healthy saint ever chooses suffering. He chooses God's will, as Jesus did, whether that means suffering or not. Paul was warned that this was going to happen, the arrest in verse 27. He was warned that there was suffering ahead. He's later beat. He's put on trial. He's going to defend himself in front of different audiences. He's shipwrecked. There's all kinds of craziness in the upcoming story of Paul. And he remains faithful to what God has called him to, even though he knows there's hardship ahead. Which then brings us back to the beginning of chapter 1. How did Paul get here? What does Paul's resolve look like, even amidst a bunch of really caring friends who are there just trying to help him out, who are trying to hear from the Lord on Paul's behalf, but his resolve is set. So let's go to chapter 21, verse 1. And what we have in the next 14 verses is a bit of travelogue interspersed with his encounter with friends, fellow disciples, those who care deeply about Paul and are trying to hear from God for Paul. So verse 21, verse 1, And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to cause, and on the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there was a ship to unload, uh, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And when they all, with wives and children, accompanying us until we were outside the city and kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on uh, board the ship, and they returned home. And when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Tolomus, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, where we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. That's an Acts 6 callback. He's one of the seven deacons appointed by the elders of the church, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. 
And while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt, bound it around his own feet and hands, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him in the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. What we have in Acts chapter 21 in those 14 verses is a fascinating glimpse into the life of the church. And a fascinating glimpse into how Paul was discerning what to do next. And these 14 verses are not only the narrative of Paul's movement and his life moving forward, but a really interesting glimpse into the prophetic landscape of the New Testament. And specifically, the three types of prophecy we see throughout the New Testament, all taking place in one snapshot in these 14 verses. And what we're going to do is we're just going to walk through this story and actually unpack a little bit of what is happening here as these friends of Paul and fellow disciples were prophetically trying to sense what would be helpful for Paul, how to encourage Paul, and even some directional stuff. Now, before we move forward, we're going to be talking a lot about prophecy because we have all three types of New Testament prophecy happening here in these 14 verses, and I want to help define for you what that is. Simply, prophecy is spirit-led revelation expressed through human words. So it's speaking in human terms, in human words, something that the Holy Spirit has sovereignly and often spontaneously revealed to somebody. It's beyond simple encouragement, and it's something that God is saying for this moment to this person for this purpose. Okay, so let's look at what is happening here in Acts chapter 21. In verse 4, after the first bit of travelogue, we see that Paul is searching out the disciples that are here in Tyre, and they stayed with them for a week. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. It's that word, through the Spirit, that is interesting and gives us a glimpse into how they were praying for and encouraging Paul. And the first thing we learn here is that this is a hint. This is the church doing 1 Corinthians 14. And this is the everyone can prophesy part of the New Testament. This is everyone, regardless of your maturity or spiritual gifting. This is something we are all invited into. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 31, For you can, some of you, prophesy. You can what? All. all. Okay, what, is, what does all mean in the Greek? Yeah, it just means all. That's a trick question. All. For you can all prophesy so that you may all learn and be encouraged. You may all prophesy one by one so that you may, be all, you may all learn and be encouraged. Now, what's the point of this? Paul tells us the point at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 through 4. He's comparing and contrasting tongues, which I'm very much not getting into today, with prophecy, what we are talking about today. He says in verse 1, pursue love, which is his wrap-up of chapter 13, and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Cool. Paul says, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So what is tongues for? It's for building up yourself. Is that a good thing, bad thing? Yeah, good thing. But the context matters, right? It's not helpful in a gathered setting like this. So Paul says, you know, take care of that on your own. But prophecy, however, what's it for? Building up the church. Encouragement, upbuilding, consolation. Now, if we just take a step aside, at Anthem, how we see this and how we hope this worked out, like Paul, we hope everybody prophesies in the body. We hope this is a piece of everybody's body life together. 
And it can often look like sharing a scripture with someone. It can look like praying for someone, encouraging someone with the end goal that that person or the body is built up, encouraged, and consoled. And this is a bit different than just simple, let me pray for you, bro. And it is taking a beat to ask the Holy Spirit, is there anything specifically that you want to say to Matt? And you know what? If there isn't, that's okay. You can just pray for the dude. <laughs> you can just open up a scripture and let the scripture encourage. But in that moment, as we are pausing and asking the Holy Spirit, he may present something. There may be a moment where he says, actually, head over to Psalm 24. And you may just be like, oh, what's in Psalm 24? And you read it, and you read it over him, and you may find that that resonates with something he's working through. Or you may get a picture in your mind. I'm picturing this, this thing. Does that mean anything to you? So when we say things like we're, we're feeling nudged by God, when we're sharing a word, when we're encouraging someone in the spirit, or maybe when we say we, we sense God is, is doing something or saying something, you might even see this happen at Anthem during the response time where maybe Matt or one of the elders or someone else in the church say, I think actually God wants us to, to pull this thread a little bit. I think he wants to encourage us in this way. That's, that's a lot of what's happening there. It's people being sensitive to what God might want to say or do in a specific moment and joining him or obeying him. So there is a, we, we did this in our community group actually recently, a couple of weeks ago. We kind of split up the guys and the girls and we just had some time to pray for one another and we had the guys around the fire pit. And uh, what we did is we say, okay, everyone just take two or three minutes and share something you're carrying in this season. What's maybe feeling heavy? What's a, a challenge in front of you? What, what just feels like it's occupying a lot of your time or your thought? So just take two or three minutes to share. You don't need the whole life story, but just like one thing. And uh, after one person shares, is okay, we're just going to take a moment, take a minute, and just ask, God, is there anything you want to encourage this person with specifically? We sat and waited, and two or three people shared. I actually feel like... Maybe God was bringing my attention to this passage. I feel like God was maybe wanting to encourage you with this particular aspect of the gospel. I said, cool. How was that? All right, next person. And we just went around the circle. And at the end, everyone was encouraged, built up, consoled. It wasn't weird. No one was like raising their hands, shaking on the floor. It wasn't like, it wasn't anything. It was just simple like, hey, we're just going to take a moment to love our brother and our sister, we're going to ask, God, do you have something specific in this moment? And more often than not, it was just a scripture he was bringing our attention to, so we went to that and we shared it. And we shared it. And we shared it humbly. We just said, hey, if, if this is encouragement, man, take it. If it's not, it's all right. Toss it. And, and particularly, when we're in a gathered moment like this, if you feel like, as you're praying, maybe in a response time, you're like, you're worshiping, you're praying, and you're really trying to step into that space, and God, do you have something for, for this community? Do you have something for someone in the room? You may feel prompted to actually go tap Micah on the shoulder and say, hey, I feel like, can I pray for you? I feel like maybe I was getting this in my head. And the worst case scenario is you pray for Micah and you encourage him. So I want to see 20 people lining up around him afterwards. <laughs> That's the worst thing. And the best thing that can happen is actually God is maybe doing something in Micah, and that is a moment of, of breakthrough or clarity or an encouragement that is coming from outside. Or you may feel like you have something for the church community. You notice we don't do like open mic situation. But you can find one of the elders. Usually some people are camping out in the front row. You say, Matt or Andrew, I actually I feel like a, a burden for this. Like is that resident? Do you guys, can you help me discern? Is that actually for our church? And what they'll probably say is maybe one of three responses is, uh, yeah, actually, we, I've been praying. Yeah, that actually resonates with something. I, I actually want you to share, and maybe we'll walk up with you and, and kind of host that moment and help you share. Or they might say, oh, that's, that's so good, but you know what? It's actually maybe not for right now. Maybe we feel like God's doing something different in this. Can you write it down and, and send it to let the elders pray over it and discern what to do with it next? Or it may be, oh, thank you so much. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, yeah, send it to us, but that's, that's not for, for now. It's not, that may be for you, that may be for someone else. Beautiful, thank you, brother, sister, but no, it's okay. There's, we're going to talk, there's loads of humility wrapped up in, in how we do this as a church. So next, in, in the narrative, we actually level up a little bit. It's not just the everyone prophesies, the praying through the Spirit, but in verses 8, we see on the next day we departed, we came to Caesarea, we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with them. And he had four unmarried daughters 
who prophesied. This language is slightly different than what's going on in verse 4. It's not everyone praying through the Spirit, but it is some who are more apt to prophesy. And this is what we call the spiritual gift of prophecy. So it's certain persons with the gift of prophecy that may be more apt to, or maybe so, it's so prominent in their life that it's recognized by or recognized in, in other people. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians 12 stuff. So in the same way that we are all called to be hospitable, in the same way we are all called to be generous, which are spiritual gifts, there are some in the body who are more apt to be those things or to lean into those things. So as we're hosting maybe people from abroad, for instance, or hosting people from out of town, and we'll say, the whole church, hey, we need some people to host. You're always at the top of the list. You're welcoming people into your home. You're, you're setting a beautiful meal. And you may be more apt to do that. Or maybe when we're talking about generosity moments as a church, there's an obedient side to generosity that we all step into. But then there's also for some in the room who have the spiritual gift of generosity that say, actually, I want to be creative with how I do this. I want to find creative ways to generate more income to give away to kingdom things. Or maybe you, you have a regular mundane job, but because you function in a generous way, God continues to give you more so you can steward more and give away more. In the same way we are all called to prophesy, there are some in the church who have a spiritual gift of prophecy where they are more apt, more sensitive, more in tune. 1 Corinthians 12, I want to read uh, a section that just talks about this a little bit. In verse 4, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, varieties of service, but the same Lord, and varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So gifts, services, activities, there's a lot of stuff happening, but it's one God who gives all. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So this is not for you to look awesome or be awesome or feel awesome. This is for the common good in the church. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between the Spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So this is key, not as you will, but as the Spirit wills. You don't get to control your own dial of how much of this gift you have. You don't even get to control what gift you have. This is apportioned by the Spirit as he willed, and we can choose to step into obedience and partnership or resist now here at Anthem, if you are more apt and prone to prophesy, if you come in day, Sunday and to your community group every moment, you're always asking God, what do you have in this moment? And the more you do that, the more you're actually able to hear and distinguish God's voice, and the more you function in obedience, this may be a gift that the Spirit is imparting to you, like generosity, like hospitality, like administration, like leadership. And so if that is you, the next step is then to discern is this, and to actually maybe bring it to the elder team and say, I think this is something the Spirit might be doing. Like, Can you help me discern if this is true or not? Do you see this pattern in my life? Is my character consistent with someone that would receive this gift? And the scary part is to practice, to actually do it, to not let moments or opportunities go by where you're, you're practicing. So if you feel this might be you, if you feel like even that spiritual gift is something the Holy Spirit may be giving you, tell somebody, tell your community group, your community group leader, tell one of the elders, I think this is brewing here, can you help me discern? And just like you would any other gift, try it out. Practice it, learn from your mistakes, and get better at it. There's an immensely practical side to discerning and using a spiritual gift. Because they're going to be misfires, and that's okay. And it's okay because we're not saying prophecy is on the level of Scripture. We're saying this is one of the gifts the Spirit gives, and like any other of the gifts, we have to try it out and get better at it. You may think good hospitality is overwhelming someone with your extroversion, and you're going to have to practice. Learn that's not the way, and try again. 
Like any other gift, there's a sense of practice. And we as a church are a place to try and to train and to get it wrong and to learn from that and to keep trying. So we walk in this gift with a ton of humility. We weigh it, test it with the scriptures, but we're also ready to be used by the Spirit as he sees fit. Now finally, as we're leveling up in our uncomfortableness in this stuff, there's one more glimpse we have into the prophetic landscape of the New Testament. And that is in verse 10, Agabus quotes the prophet. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus, came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and says, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Okay, so we have another kind of roll, another glimpse into the prophetic landscape of the New Testament with the prophet. And that what we get Kind of the most learning about this role is from Ephesians chapter 4, which are not spiritual gifts. They're gifts from Jesus to the church. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, Jesus gave the prophets, or the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And this may be the one most of us are uncomfortable with, depending on your background, your heritage. And so simply, a couple of thoughts on the prophet in the New Testament. What we know is they are known and recognized by others. Agabus the prophet, he was known and recognized by others as having this particular spiritual gift that might carry some level of authority and accountability. Now, a word on authority. This is not thus says the Lord, style authority. It's not positional authority, but it's the kind of authority that makes you want to listen. It's what we call not positional, but influential authority. Because the mark of a prophet would be, behind their rearview mirror, a healthy, credible, and mature prophetic ministry. Not wackos predicting the future, but as you look back on years and decades, you actually see they are in tune with the heart of God. In their character, and their actions, they're consistent. And so they carry a level of authority, not as I have to do what they say, or they are the boss of me, or they are speaking for God, so I must listen unequivocally, but I know this person, their life, their ministry, so when they speak, I want to listen. When they speak, I know it carries weight, not because they're demanding authority, but because the credibility of the ministry that has gone behind them. And they can be recognized by this consistent and mature ministry, and thus it has credibility. But I think the most important facet of the prophet that we see in the New Testament from Ephesians 4.11 is their specific purpose is not to be a rock star prophet, as it were, but to train other people. It's a humble teaching, training type role. They're equipping the saints. So there's responsibility in that gift and in that role to train up and equip other people. In the same way, a Ephesians 4 style teacher is not just a good teacher, but someone who is training teachers behind them. Now, if you hear me talk about the prophet and, and the role in the office and all this stuff, and, it, and you just record, now I, I come from a pretty... Uh, a background that would be pretty averse to a lot of this stuff. And so I'm, I'm with you in the room as we wrestle with the tension of the text. But if you hear me talk about this and you're just recoiling, a few things I am not saying. We are not saying that the way the New Testament talks about prophets is the same as the way the Old Testament speaks of prophets. A key difference, we all have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside us. This was not true of the people of Israel. They needed people from time to time to reveal the heart of God and shape them in a certain direction. It's quite different where we all have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Can all, we all have access to God. And so it's quite different. What I'm not saying is that prophets are unaccountable because they sound spiritual or they say, thus says the Lord or whatever. You shouldn't say that, but if they say that, I'm not saying they're unaccountable. They're actually quite accountable, like any other gift and role in the life of the church. They are accountable. 
I am not saying prophets have authority over the elders or leaders in the church. We would recognize the elder team as the highest spiritual authority in the local church. And we're not saying that prophets have authority over you as someone who is filled with the Spirit. It is your job to discern and to weigh. So if you encounter a prophet that is trying to override those levels of authority, you know to not listen to them, to run. What I am saying, though, is that prophets do have a long and mature history of prophetic ministry that gives them credibility and a desire for us to lean in and listen. What I am saying is that the church is better for their voice. That is, they are deeply sensitive and aware of the heart of God, and we need that voice in the life of the body. I am saying they are held accountable, just like any other person and position in the church. And I am saying their primary role is actually to teach and to train others, not to command a bunch of attention, not to go on a speaking tour, not to generate a lot of money, but to actually be of service to the local church in training people how to hear from God well. So we have three kind of glimpses of the prophetic landscape that are happening in Acts 21. But here's the thing about Acts 21. Paul doesn't listen to them. This is why. Did you catch that? So we can, we can build our case and we get this glimpse from Acts 21. And Acts 21 is this great example of the different types of prophecy we have in the New Testament. But we also have this weird tension. Paul tells us we should pursue, we should desire, we should be using this gift. And then he just doesn't listen. Did you just catch that? Look at verse 13. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. Knock it off, guys. For I am ready to not only be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, everyone agrees, the will of the Lord be done. So this moment provides some interesting lessons for us today. The first lesson is discerning the difference between prophecy and an interpretation or application. So this may be the first obvious thing we can note is that Paul doesn't listen, but we also can note that these prophecies were generally true. Everyone was saying, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to face trouble. Did Paul face trouble? You betcha. Everyone said, you're going to be bound up. You're going to, re- you're going to face resistance. There's going to be hostility. All that stuff happens. This is interesting tension we walk in that he receives three prophetic warnings. And for us, as we're learning from Paul, we have to differentiate between what might be God's revelation to a person in a moment and the things we say after that, (laughs) our application, our interpretation, which is typically where we get some of that stuff wrong. It seems clear the prophecies were true, but that the interpreting of those prophecies were off. They were telling him, avoid trouble, avoid suffering, avoid Jerusalem. And Paul, who had conviction about his assignment from God, was not persuaded. The Spirit reveals what will happen, but the response of those around Paul is driven by their own concern and love for him. If you keep going down this road, there's nothing but trouble that's coming. Paul received these prophecies. He knew it would actually be true that he was going to suffer. He also knew God was calling him to it anyway, and he wasn't dissuaded by well-meaning friends around him. New Testament theologian N.T. Wright says, Sometimes it seems the Spirit gives people enough information to know what is likely await them, but leaves them with the responsibility of deciding whether or not to go anyway. And Paul was settled in his mind. He had to go. Which leads us to our second lesson we can learn is that giving or receiving prophecy requires humility. Humility requires humility to be wrong. And this is part of the practice stuff. Prophecy is not on the level of Scripture, so we cannot present it as such. And if a person does, you should run, by the way. We can get it wrong in the same way we can get hospitality wrong, in the same way we can get leadership wrong, in the same way you can get administration wrong. You can get that stuff wrong because we are humans partnering with the very Spirit of God trying to obey and follow him better. So a few best practices. For the giver, if you are maybe desiring this gift or you see it working out in your life, best practices, to have humility to be corrected. 
you are not uncorrectable because you feel like you've heard something from God. So as you're giving it, you can do things like, hey, how is this sitting with you? Is this resonating? Was this off? And explicitly, you can tell them, hey, if any of this is not helpful, just chuck it. Like, do wait, I don't, I don't want my, my kind of messing this up to get in the way of what God's doing with you. Or just, hey, shelf it. Like, write it down, record it, come back to it. Ask the elders to pray over it with you. Just come back to it. It's all right. The humility to do all that stuff. And then thank them for the feedback. If I'm going to pray for Celeste, and I'm, and I'm really trying to hear from the Spirit for her for this moment, and uh, she's saying, oh, man, Brett, so kind of you. Thank you for praying for me. Uh, none of that was right. <laughs> that was all bad. What I do is I don't walk away hurt or, you know, offended or whatever. I say, thank you. That's actually helping me discern. I'm new at this. I'm trying this out. I want to know, how does this stuff work? Thank you for the feedback. As the receiver, know that God may use someone to communicate something to you. We can hear God in all sorts of ways through his scripture, through prayer, through worship, through nature. We can, we can experience God and hear from God in all sorts of different ways. And often he loves to use his church to encourage his people. Be ready to receive. Be ready to put it on the shelf. Be ready to take it to the elders to discern. Be ready to take it to your community to sit with it. Prophecy requires humility to be corrected. But all this to say, even Paul's interaction with the prophetic, even with these lessons, Paul still unequivocally instructs us to eagerly desire this stuff. This doesn't mean, as some, because it's complicated, because it's tricky, and because we're, it's where the human and divine are interacting, and we can get this wrong, and we don't want to get it wrong, so we just close ourselves off to it anyway. This doesn't mean we just chuck it all together. Because Paul sees this gift and this action as integral to the life of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 5.20, Paul simply says, do not despise prophecies. And then we have to wrestle with our, how much do you want to obey the Bible question. How much do you want to obey the Bible? You can say 70% and be honest with yourself. <laughs> but if we want to say 100%, we have to look at our posture. Whatever our experience, whatever our background is, Paul says, do not despise prophecies. But instructively, he says in verse 21, test everything and hold fast to what is good. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Search, discern prayerfully with scripture open, with leaders, with community. Say, is this what God has for me? If it's not, toss it. If it is, hold fast to what is good. We test it all. John says, test all the spirits in 1 John 4. And Paul again in 1 Corinthians 14 says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. There's a weighing, a testing, a discerning, but we still eagerly pursue it. In, verse four, in chapter 14 again, he says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And then at the end of that chapter, my brothers and sisters earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. Often we go right to verse 40 and we skip <laughs> verse 39. In order, we're not going to have any of this stuff messing up. We got a plan for the day, you know, none of this messiness of prophetic words or anything like that. We got to make room for it. Earnestly desire it. And don't forbid it. But we should do things in order, with clarity. And to be clear, as a church, we want to walk in this stuff. We, we know we want to walk in it well, with loads of humility, knowing that this is a place to try and train. No one has to be perfect. You don't have to be a perfect worship leader, perfect teacher, perfect greeter, perfect kids' classroom worker. You don't have to be a perfect prophesier. But we want to try and we want to train and we want to grow because Paul says we should desire this. And it's actually for our common good, our upbuilding, our encouragement, and our consolation. And so I know where the room is at. I know there are people with stories in here where you are just discovering the reality that God might want to use you to bless somebody else. And there's like a beautiful newness to that. I also know there are some in this room, uh, myself included, who have maybe had some health, unhealthy experiences and environments around things like spiritual gifts. 
that can be used and abused, that there's weird subculture that can go along with it, and we don't want any of that mess, but we do want what the Spirit has to offer us. And there might be some here putting an unbiblical amount of weight in these types of gifts. And for everyone, Acts 21 is this really interesting picture of how Paul, threading the needle between not only the prophetic and the practical, but also God's voice and his dependent on God's voice to go. And so as you're discerning for for somebody else, for yourself, I think today is a beautiful chance to step into the kind of dependence on Jesus that this requires in a greater way. That whatever your background is, the prayer of our church is, God, if this is you, I want more of it. If it's not you, keep me from it. Deliver me from this stuff. Keep me away from this stuff. But if it's you, I want more of you because I want to be dependent on you. I want to walk with you. I want to keep in step with your spirit and not let, positive or negative, my experiences inform what I choose to let God do or not do in my life, but instead with humility to open the text and say, God, what do you have for me? And how can I walk with you today? And so we're going to respond in, in worship. And, and this is even, at Anthem, this is one of those places we can try and train. We have people who would love to pray for you, our prayer teams, and they will listen to the Spirit with you. They will ask, God, is there something particular you want to share with Micah, with Doug, with Celeste? We're going to sing, and as we worship, worship is often an atmosphere for our increased awareness of what God might be doing. And so if you're feeling like a prompting, it's like, I I feel like I should go pray for Micah. Go pray for Micah. What's the worst that happens? Micah gets prayed for a dozen times today. I was like, if that's the worst thing that could happen, like, that's, that's pretty good. But you also might join the Holy Spirit in the work he's doing in and through somebody else. So go ahead and stand with me as we sing, we receive communion, we give, and we pray with one another. All is response to God's word and acts of worship. We're going to pray just a really simple and dangerous invitation. God, would you use me? So if you would, if you're comfortable, would you put your hands out in front of you, just like an openness posture, and say, Jesus, we love you. We know you love this church, and we desire to join you in your work, in the nations, in our neighborhood, and in this room. Jesus, we ask that you would use us. We want to be a blessing to our church and to build up and encourage the church. And so as we take just a few moments to pause, to sing, to pray, Holy Spirit, what do you have for us today? Thank you.